Anyone can be Prime Minister. Something a bit fishy. Blowout party put into a fake prison. Oh! G'day guys, hello, welcome. My name is Adrian Allerberg. If you're new, smash that subscribe button. If you've been here a while, just, just smash the like button. One of the two, smash something. So if you're a Game of Thrones fan and you are up to date now, at the point of recording this, episode five had just come out. So hopefully something doesn't happen in episode six that throws all of what I'm about to say in the bin. Now a lot of people saw Daenerys' sudden change and I guess her change over the trajectory of the eight seasons and sort of asked why, like why the hell would that happen? She started so good and ended so bad. Daenerys became, wait for it, corrupted. Which leads me to the thesis of this video, does power corrupt or do the corrupt seek power? So first on the subject of power, now how do you define power? Power is the capacity or ability to direct or influence the behavior of others. In a nutshell, that's probably the simplest way you can possibly define it. Now, there's obviously several different types of power. You've got physical power, you've got military power, but in addition to that, you can also have things like fame, uh, popularity, that's also a form of power. That's gonna help you influence people. And finally, there's money. Now, if we're gonna talk about power in like a governmental sort of way, if you're a leader, power is something you obviously need. You use it to enact your course of action, whatever that may be, you need it to move forward. A Prime Minister is not going to get shit done if no one's listening to him. He needs that power. Or she needs that power. G needs that form of power. Z needs that form of power. Jesus Christ, Adrian, it's 2019. Anyone can be Prime Minister. A good way to look at power is the way I've looked at it is it's, it's like uh, petrol. Gasoline for you Americans. Power, if used properly and carefully, can do amazing things. It can drive your car. It can light a fire. It can do things that are very necessary and very important. However, if abused, if used carelessly, if used to excess, power can create a massive shitstorm. Things can blow up, things can burn. You understand what I'm trying to say here. The point is, use properly, power is absolutely necessary. So a fellow by the name of Lord Acton once said, power tends to corrupt, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Basically suggesting that anyone given even the smallest bit of power is super likely to just become corrupt and absolutely abuse it. So to understand corruption, you need to understand the two forms of power, which is socialized power and personalized power. Now, socialized power is power used to benefit others. Of course, this is what we're after in all our leaders, in you know managers, all that sort of stuff, CEOs of businesses, you name it. Then there's personalized power, which is using power for your own gain. Of course, these two things aren't mutually exclusive. For example, there's a lot of leaders who, while benefiting the entire community, are also scraping a little bit off for themselves and benefiting both at the same time. The problem happens when it goes way too out of whack and the personalized power dominates over the socialized, meaning that they benefit themselves to the detriment of everybody else. That's when corruption takes place. Let me now introduce you to a fellow you might not have heard of by the name of Kwame Kilpatrick. In 2001, Kilpatrick became the youngest mayor of Detroit when he was elected at age 31. He became a people's favorite and was even known as the hip hop mayor. He was a cool guy, everyone was excited to have him in, Detroit was having problems, so it was a big deal. So in 2005, he was criticized for using city funds to lease a car for use by his family and using his city-issued credit card to charge thousands of dollars worth of spas, massages, extravagant dining, and expensive wine. Time Magazine actually named him as one of the worst mayors in all of America. The Detroit Free Press reported that over the first 33 months of his term, Kilpatrick had charged over $210,000 for travel, meals, and entertainment. People are starting to cotton on that this bloke's absolutely taking the piss. Now, he was then up for re-election after his term finished. Amazingly, he he came back from huge unpopularity to win a second term. Now his second term was even worse than the first term. Old mate Kwame went to court for violating what's called the whistleblower law after he fired two of his employees who were doing an internal investigation into his personal actions. Sounds like a real honest guy, you know, a man of the people. Transparency, that's key. Now they were investigating allegations that he'd had this massive blowout party with strippers and God knows what else at the mayoral residence. Now a short time after this party was said to occur, one of the prostitutes who was at the party was found dead and was shot dead by the very gun that is issued to the Detroit Police Department. Something a bit fishy going on here, Mr. Kwame. On top of that, Kwame was married with children. He went to court and said that he was not having an affair with his chief of staff. 14,000 text messages later, 
he was having an affair with his chief of staff. He also employed 29 of his closest family and friends, most of which were not at all qualified in the highest jobs of the city and funneled $175,000 of the state's money into this vague company which only had one employee. And who was that one employee? Well, I'll tell you who that one employee was. His fucking wife. And finally, it came to a close in 2010 when he was charged, put in front of a judge and convicted with bribery, fraud and a whole bunch of other gnarly shit which he's now serving 28 years in prison for. Long story short, this is a man who is very, very corrupt. Textbook corruption case. So, does power corrupt? Here I'd like to reference a study by a fellow named Philip Zimbardo from the early 1970s. Now this is something that in psychology we studied a shitload, like it's a very well cited experiment, which is basically looking at the brutality of prison guards in the US prison system, trying to figure out whether it was that the guards themselves were very sadistic and, and loved, you know, being cruel, or if it was actually the environment that they were put in. Now in this study, a random group of volunteers was split into two groups. One was prison guards and the other one was prisoners. The mock-up prison was in the basement of the psychology building at Stanford University and to make it as realistic as possible, they completely kitted it out, jail bars, everything was made to look exactly like a prison. To make it even more realistic, the prisoners were taken from their homes in real police cars, taken to a police station, Properly like fucking all their paperwork was done, all their fingerprints taken, handcuffs, all this shit, a couple of these ones, taken down there, blindfolded, and put into the little mock-up prison. The guards worked eight-hour shifts, they rotated, and the guards were told, you can do what you want, just don't physically hurt them. And that's exactly what they did. And it wasn't long before the guards started abusing their power. They'd go in at 2.30 in the morning, blow their whistles, wake everyone up, and have them say their prisoner numbers. They'd get them to do demeaning tasks that had no real purpose, and if they didn't do it, the only punishment was push-ups. If they were really misbehaving, the guards would send the prisoners into solitary confinement. Now basically things escalated more and more, to the point that some prisoners were fighting against other prisoners, they were taking sides, with the guards, the guards were like emotionally abusing them. It became like fucking hectic. Like prisoners were like crying, saying they wanted to go home. It was actually out of control. It was only shut down when someone from external came in to see what was going on and basically forced them to shut it down. She's like, this is not an experiment, this is fucking cruel. So six days into the two weeks, the thing was too fucked to go on. I believe that's what was written on the actual, uh, you know, post experiment analysis. That was in the discussion. Too fucked to go on. So what did people take from this? Firstly, the fact that we can slip into roles very easily. The guards who were just university aged blokes very quickly became guards. And the prisoners very quickly became prisoners because those were the roles. But on top of that, it shows that given a small amount of power, people are very quick to abuse it. The main criticism of Zimbardo's study, which he himself has acknowledged and says, yeah, that is very true, is that because the study was voluntary, because people had to sign up for themselves and obviously weren't forced to do it, like the people who saw the flyer and were willing to participate in a two week long experiment where you're going to be put into a fake prison may not represent the average person. Someone who's willing to take two weeks out of their time, potentially to be a guard, I imagine most of them wanted to be guards, is probably not a good representation of the average person. Funnily enough, all the people in the test were blokes, they were all like college age guys, and it's very likely that they were more cruel or more sadistic than the average person. Otherwise they might not have signed up for it. Now they had the opportunity, they absolutely took it. Which leads me to the main point of this video, my argument, which is summed up very nicely by one Abraham Lincoln, you might have heard of him, who said, nearly all men can stand adversity, but if you want to test a man's character, give him power. To extend this idea, Joe McGee, who was a professor of management at New York University says, power isn't corrupt it's freeing. What power does is that it liberates the true self to emerge. More of us walk around with kinds of social norms. We work in groups that exert all pressures on us to conform. Once you get into a position of power, then you can be whoever you are. So the idea here is very clear. You might be a good person, you might be a bad person, but all the pressure you've got from social norms, from people in authority, sort of holds you back and stops you from expressing who you really are at your core. But as soon as you're given a position of power, all of a sudden it's like fucking sweet. I can do whatever I want. Fuck you. Think about that idea of people who are like, 
you know, win the lotto, and then they just tell their old boss to go fuck themselves. You know what I mean? Like, it's it's what you've always wanted to do, but now you've got the means and the opportunity and the power to do that. On top of that, other studies have found that people in positions of power are less likely to take on the perspectives of other people. Which reminds me of that Tywin Lannister quote. The wise king knows what he knows and what he doesn't. Now, it wouldn't be an Adrian Allenberg video with a bit of bloody research, wouldn't it? So, let's cast our minds back to 2012. Avicii was in the charts, fucking dubstep was big, and also this study by Decelis came out. Now in this study, the researchers got a group of people and found their moral identity scores by basically asking them questions about how important moral qualities were to them. From those questionnaires, they could find out who were the more morally strong people and who were more morally weak. Now this is where it gets interesting. Half of them wrote an essay about just random shit, like what happened yesterday. The other half, ladies and gentlemen, had to write an essay on a time that they felt really powerful. The point of that, basically trying to get them into this powerful state by recalling a time you were powerful makes you feel powerful again. Then they set an experiment which tried to figure out how much they would sacrifice the interests of the group to benefit themselves. A little schnicker schnick. The participants were told that they were now gonna enter a lottery where they have a chance of winning a $100 online gift card. They were told that there's a pool of 500 points and a lot of other participants trying to play as well. Each participant was told that they have between zero and 10 points to play with. And the more points you took, the greater chance you had at winning that gift card. Now, if all the participants took too many, the pool would be empty and the game would be called off. If you took like all 10, Yes, your chances of winning are higher, but there was a much higher chance you were gonna ruin the lottery for everybody. So once they did that, everyone took how many points they wanted. So in the group of people who wrote the essay earlier that made them feel powerful, those with a low moral identity, those who are seen as more morally weak, actually took an average of 7.5 points of those 10 points. But those who had a stronger moral identity actually took only an average of 5.5 points significantly lower. The point here being, if you are given power, what you do with that power, how much you fuck over the common good in favor of your own needs, is all dependent on what your moral identity is going into it. Therefore, a good person getting power is gonna do more good. A bad person getting power, however, becomes even worse. What a cunt! Which leads me back to Game of Thrones. Now, if we are to go by what Abraham Lincoln said, if we're to look at Daenerys, who started off Game of Thrones incredibly weak and an incredibly low position, she had so many constraints upon her, she couldn't at all act in a way that's consistent with how she feels. Which suggests to me, in those first few episodes, we have no fucking clue if she's a good person or not. We literally don't know. She could be really good, or she could be really bad. What this model of power and Abraham Lincoln tell us is to judge her on when she has the most power. And episode five, the moment she takes King's Landing, is when she has the most power. When we can most accurately judge what kind of a person she is. And hey, who would have thought? She turns out to be a bit of a cunt. And the same could be said of all the world's worst leaders. Look at Hitler, look at Stalin. These were not good people who became corrupt as they gained more power. These are bad people from the start who just gained power and were able to act on those bad impulses. But hey, I might be wrong. Let me know in the comments below. Do you agree? Do you have a different opinion? Maybe power does corrupt. I don't know. Let me know in the comments. Thank you very much for watching, guys. Smash that subscribe button. Press the uh, press that like button while you're at it. And I'll see you next week for some more videos and Sunday Night Live this Sunday. I'll see you then. Good night for now. Bonjour. Is that hello or goodbye? I don't know. Bye.